Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming and welcome to this talk. Uh, I noticed that the organizers very specifically chose to ignore my punerific main title and went for what games user research can learn from mainstream user research. I think it's probably for the best. Uh, one thing to point out is I'm using probably about a 10 year old meme. That shows how old I am and that <laughs> is relevant. So I'd like to bring it up shortly. Um, this is us. I'm Alistair and this is Steve. Hi, uh, Steve is going to talk, first of all, about his experience <coughs> and why you should listen to him and care about what he's got to say. I don't know if I can convince people to listen to me. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Bromley. I'm a user researcher. Um, for nearly five years, I worked with the research team here in London for PlayStation. Hi. <laughs> um, the team here, as we're going to hear about later, works on many of the first and second party games that PlayStation make. Um, there's some well-known ones, such as Horizon, No Man's Sky, uh, SingStar. There are some less well-known ones, which is, including PlayStation Vita Pets, which never quite got the critical acclaim I believe it deserves. Um, in the last year of being here, or being at PlayStation, a lot of the work that I did was on the PlayStation VR headset, working alongside the team to work on the hardware itself, and also many of the launch games, including uh, PlayStation VR Worlds, which included the, the Shark Tank game, The Deep, and London Heist, uh, and Rush of Blood, which is another launch game for the PlayStation VR. About a year ago, I left PlayStation to lead a new user research team at Parliament here in the UK. So Parliament's doing lots of exciting things. They're helping people understand what their MPs are up to and decide if they like their MP or not. Um, they are helping people petition the government if they are upset with the things that the government are currently doing. Um, and this experience has taught me a lot about user research and the, a variety of methods for user research, which I hope to share with you all today. Uh, Alistair. All righty. So I'm Alistair. Um, Steve went from games to mainstream. I went from mainstream to games. So I started off at an e-commerce agency called Ominor way back in 2006. Uh, they did uh, basically e-commerce sites for a variety of clients. I did fishing tackle. I did um, reading assists for older people, although how on earth they were able to use the internet back in 2006 to buy the things, it doesn't matter. Uh, 2007, I went on to a uh, user research and accessibility agency called Rogue Credible. Um, and there I spent four and a half years working on essentially every single industry, <coughs> government, uh, games uh, for a bit, um, charity, e-commerce obviously, entertainment, um, everything essentially. Oh, a lot of insurance as well. Not so interesting that, I must be said. Um, then I went into my kind of transition periods and I ended up at Pottermore. Uh, Pottermore, any Harry Potter fans? Yay. Okay, so go there if you're a fan of Harry Potter because it has loads of extra content. And I was there for the months leading up to the launch and the months just post-launch. And it was just insane. It was really, really popular, although I claim zero responsibility for any experience that you get there. Just to <laughs> disclaim it now. Um, and then I went on to Play Research. This is an independent game user research agency. Um, I've been there for five years now uh, and I've Again, worked on almost every platform and literally every genre. So we're going to talk to you guys about the differences between mainstream user research and games user research and why we think it reflects on how we work today. So let's talk about some differences. Uh, mainstream user research is a lot less secretive than games user research, massively so. Mainstream user research is constantly, always organizing events where they can talk to each other about approaches, methods, findings, even just the full set of data. Everything is shared. It's an unbelievable, open experience. When you compare that to the games industry, which is obviously absolutely terrified of leaks, absolutely terrified of spoilers, there is much, much less communication. Even within the same company, I'm aware of game user researchers working on the same or incredibly similar games, and yet they cannot talk to each other about the work that they're doing, which is insane. They know exactly what game they're working on, and yet they can't say what they've learned, what has been good, what has been bad, what data they have, etc., etc. This leads to very significant issues about cross-pollination of ideas. Everyone 
individually is reinventing the wheel. Everyone is having to learn for the first time how to do these different things. And it leads to a massive stunting in the development of our industry, which I think is a really significant problem. Steve has moved from games into government, which is unbelievably open. Yes, and um, one of the experiences that stood out for me is I, I've always been an avid blogger ever since Graham McAllister set it as some homework back in 2009. Uh, I've kept up with it ever since. Um, at a certain point with games user research, you run out of things that you can talk about without sharing secret details. So you can't talk about the, the games you're working on, you can't talk about how you've applied the methods for specific research challenges. And that's been one of the big differences I've found since moving to the public sector, where they don't want you to shut up, they want you to keep on talking about, okay, here's exactly what we're working on at the moment, here's where your taxpayers' money is going, and here's how we're getting insights that are making a difference to the public based on the research work that's being done. Cool. So I think it's great that this is happening today, but in mainstream they have one of these every week, every evening almost. Uh, mainstream user research is also a lot more mature. You get a lot less resistance as a result. So you don't get this kind of quotes. I've experienced these kind of things. We don't need UX. Our designers are too good. What a waste of time. You don't get that in mainstream. Or you do, but much, much less. Much less. And that means that it's much easier. There's much more buying from the start. You have to spend a lot less effort and a lot less time trying to persuade them about the amount of influence that you guys should have on a product. It also leads to larger budgets because they know the, the quality and the, the, the advantages that uh, games user research or user research generally can bring. And therefore, as a result, there is a lot greater method variety. You've got more money to play with. You can do better stuff. Steve. Thank you. Um, so there's this ethos in uh, mainstream user research about making user research collaborative and involving the development team throughout the process. Um, this struck me because uh, my personal experience of working in games user research uh, meant that we had plenty of scenarios like this, which might be very familiar to some of you, where a, a development team will ask you to run a round of research and you'll meet them for about half an hour to understand what they want to learn from it. And then you as the researcher will go away, you'll plan a study, you'll write a discussion guide, you will recruit some users, and then you run some research. You'll invite the development team to come and watch, but they're all busy. You might get one or two producers because they don't work quite so hard coming to see, <laughs> but only one or two days. Um, and then you will go away, write up the report, and present it back to the development team. There are a number of missed opportunities here and a number of risks that you're introducing by not letting the, the development team have a deep level of engagement with the whole research process. One is it makes it very easy to disregard your results. You're going to write a report and then just lob it over the fence to the development team. They haven't seen the, uh, the rigour that you've put into the research and uh, given you the credibility from understanding, OK, you've understood the problems we're trying to address and you've tackled it in an appropriate way and these insights are actionable and something we should do something about. Uh, even worse, it introduces the risk of misunderstanding or misrepresentation of your results. So the team, having not been exposed to how the research was run and what uh, the, the depth of the findings, may misunderstand your findings and then do the wrong thing. Or even worse, pick out one that kind of agrees with an argument they've been having recently on their team and say, oh yeah, this proves that I was right all along and so we should go and do this thing that I, I think we should do again, without understanding the context of your, of your research and how that research came about. So there are a number of opportunities when you're running a round of research to involve your development team at a greater level, not only getting the research question from them, but going through the discussion guide with them, um, uh, showing them how the tasks relate to the objectives that you're going to be um, answering with it, and helping craft what the session will actually be with your wider team. Uh, this level of understanding about, okay, what are we actually doing in the research and what are we going to find out, means that the team can take a more active role during the actual research itself. You can do facilitated note-taking sessions where they understand, okay, this is what we're looking for and we can take some notes and we can, uh, our insights will also feed into what we take from the research. Uh, they have a different perspective and different depth of insight about the mechanics behind the game and how the game works, which can really add value to you as a researcher by doing this. 
again, if you're getting your development team to take notes and to actually partake as researchers in the session, you can uh, do collaborative analysis with them, which is something I'll talk more about in a second. And finally, instead of just writing the report, you can also workshop with them to work out what's the, how to apply those results after and help make sure they're taking the right conclusions from it, which is something that is done quite well already. Uh, I've seen it at PlayStation when I was there. And again, it's part of this ethos of involving the team in the research at every point. So we're going to talk about collaborative analysis in a bit more depth. Uh, collaborative analysis is the idea of that bit when you're doing analysis, the team are doing it with you. Assuming your team have been exposed enough to the research process that they understand what you're looking for and are taking good quality notes, you can then run a workshop with them to help to do this analysis as a team. To prepare for that, you can uh, create a space where you've got different sections set up with different objectives that you're learning from the research or different mechanics. So on the wall, you could say, here's everything about uh, level one, here's everything about level two, here's everything about level three. And then you ask each of the team to talk through the notes that they've taken, uh, representing the participant that they observed. So they'll say, okay, first this player did this, and then they did this, and then they did this. And for each of those, they'll stick the post-it notes up in the relevant sections. Um, this means that everyone who partakes in that can have a playback of what happened in every research session and build up a more complete picture of what happened in every session, even if they couldn't attend every one of them. There are a number of potential risks you might be thinking about this. One is, okay, no matter how good your development team are, they're not really researchers. They're not going to have the depth and level of insight that us as researchers would be able to get. Um, there's a couple of ways to mitigate this. So one is, if you do spend that time to un make sure they understand what they're trying to learn from the research, you will improve the quality of their note-taking and their insights. Also, it's important to note that this isn't the reporting stage. This isn't the final report you're going to do. This is an activity with the team before you write the report to help make sure they understand what happened in all the sessions. So you still, as the researcher, have time to add your own expert insights, to cut out the stuff that's nonsense or opinions or not valid, uh, so that the final report represents good quality research. The other thing you might be thinking is this sounds like it takes a lot of time. Um, it is something you can run the day after the, the research. It means the report will take slightly longer to come about, but it does mean you're exposing your, your wider team to research insights from the day after the research finishes. And so they are able to start thinking about, okay, what can we do to address some of these issues early on without having to wait until the report before uh, starting to understand what the problems were. There are a number of other methods that I think we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alistair. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, a significant issue I feel that occurs in games user research. I'm about to show you four different labs from four different studios. Can you see any pattern? Uh, there is a very significant reliance in games user research for large scale multi person play testing. Um, why? Why is this? Well, it's easy to grok, it's easy to understand. If you're trying to persuade a team that's slightly cynical about the benefits of games user research, if you say there's lots of numbers, then they go, oh, brilliant, lots of numbers means it must be reliable then. Uh, it's, and, and if you're talking about the process, you just say lots of people are going to play your game, you're going to observe it and gather that data. It's really, really easy for someone who is, uh, like I say, harder to persuade to be convinced that this is a good approach to take. But it's definitely not the only approach. And it's definitely not always going to be the best approach. So there are other different approaches that could be, uh, could be used and should be considered every, any single time that you, you'd be given a research question. That's me. Yes. Cool. Um, so there are really two parts of making stuff that researchers can have an impact. Um, they can help inform a decision, so getting the, the designers, developers insight before they make something, and they can also help validate after that decision has been made, okay, is it working the way you expected? Is it doing what you want? And as we've seen from Alistair, um, Game Duty Research is very focused on that latter part, so a decision has been made, we've made something, is it any good? That's a very expensive way of going about doing things. It takes a bunch of time to, to build something, it takes a significant development cost to actually build something before you know if it's any good. Uh, it also has a, a, 
uh, leads to a mental commitment to the idea. So after a designer has come up with this idea, they're probably pretty happy with it and they're going to stick with it even if later on you think, oh, this isn't the best way of doing it. So one of the places that a researcher can have significant impact, especially for game user research, is before decisions are made about how things should be implemented or how things should work. There are uh, a huge number of techniques to do this kind of generative research to help inspire solutions. Uh, a couple on, I'll focus on a couple today, though, that could be particularly applied to games user research. Um, one of them is the idea of competitor reviews. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, where you look at what other people are doing. The team that you're working with, if they're making a dance game, aren't making the first dance game ever. Other people have made dance games. And there's stuff that we can take from other people's implementation. This is on two levels, both looking at specific features. So if you know your team are working on a feature, looking at best practice from other games and giving that to the team at the right point before they make the decision about how they're going to implement it. But also, you as a researcher can learn a lot about players' behavior from other, um, other games without having to build it. So again, thinking about the dancing game example, you can look at other dancing games and find out OK, when do people play this game? How long does a game session last? Um, what are the context of play? So where are they doing it? And from that, you can get a whole lot of insight that will help inform design decisions later on before the team have already committed to an idea. Another research technique people might be familiar with is the idea of card sorting or tree testing. So card sorting, I'm sure you're familiar with, is you have a bunch of concepts and you ask users to put them in groups in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, tree testing is almost the opposite, where you propose a structure for some information, like a menu, and you ask uh, people to perform common tasks and then see if they go the places you thought they would go to do that task. This is used outside of games, often for, for navigation on websites, that kind of thing, or menus. And, and games have menus too, so you could see if people want to, uh, if they can find where the subtitle option is, but that's not particularly exciting. There are much more exciting ways. So games do have dense information. You think about RPGs, you have a lot of things that you collect, and people need to access those things at short notice and find them. Again, in collectible card games, people are managing a lot of complex information, and they're required to find those at the appropriate times. And you can encourage your design team to uh, explore how that information should be organized and how it should be categorized before they actually commit to building it using techniques like this. Uh, a third area that's interesting is paper prototyping. Again, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the idea of making a lo-fi uh, equivalent of how the system will work, either through something like PowerPoint or Keynote, or on paper, where you build the system in paper before you actually commit to building it in code. There was a really good article on Game of Sutra this year about a virtual reality game. There was a, a mystery game, and they had a series of clues. They want to understand if players could follow the clues and come to the right conclusion. You could build that. It, you could get some artists to model the, the, the clues, and you could build the VR engine in the world, and then see if people could follow the clues to come to the right conclusion. But the team instead just built it on paper. They printed out pictures of the clues, uh, printed out pictures of the, the stimulus, so what information people were given and when, and then gave that to users to see if they could follow the clues and come to the right conclusion successfully before they had to commit to actually building this and doing it. The, another method to talk about is ethnography. So especially with mobile games or VR games, the context of play is very important. And making sure that your design team understands how people will be playing it and where they'll be playing it before they commit to ideas can help make sure they have good insights. So again, going to watch players play real things in the right context. Uh, a particular example of this is the Kinect. So the Kinect is built for American living rooms and doesn't work particularly well in European or Japanese living rooms because the experiences designed for it are just too big and require too much space that you don't find in a, a living room here. Again, given an, a better understanding of people's context of how they play and where they play, the design team could have taken some actions before they'd built it to help manage um, this working for a, a global audience. So these are some methods that you can use to understand users before you design something. And I think I'm just going to talk about what you can do with this information. So you have done this um, amazing piece of research. 
and you found some incredible insights that you think the, design, the development team, design team are going to find really, really useful and make an unbelievable game as a result. However, if, that, if those findings are forgotten, if the, those findings are ignored, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done because it's going to be lost. It's going to be forgotten and therefore you've wasted your time. So ensuring that your insight, ensuring that your, um, your, your, these findings are retained, used, remembered throughout the project is absolutely vital. I am worryingly obsessed with personas um, to, to, to a sort of really significant way. Um, I think they are great. These uh, personas are a, a communication tool. They are used to um, squeeze a, an incredibly large amount of data into a, a very small space that makes it easier to swallow. I must emphasize, however, these personas are not based on market research. They're not based on target demographics. These are based on actual processed um, live research that's conducted within the user research field. So interviews, uh, everything that uh, Steve said, um, ethnography. Um, so basically all this primary research that you're taking, you're going to end up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of findings. And all of it is going to be pure gold, obviously. And yet, if you hand over a 400-page report to a developer, <coughs> do you think they're going to read it? Probably not. Um, personas are a way of squeezing the, the unbelievable findings that you've created down into a, a form that's rememberable, recognizable, and reusable. And I emphasize the reusable. If you create personas, you put them up on the wall, and then they gather dust, and they're never referred to again, sorry, you've just wasted your time. doesn't matter how good they are. They need to be remembered. Um, I worked with a researcher who, when they produced a new set of personas for a project, they hired in uh, actors, amateur actors, to come in and play the roles of those people for an afternoon, uh, just so the developers could have contact with the personas to a much more real, significant degree, so they'd be more easily remembered. What you want to see is these personas brought up in design and development conversations. So build a, sorry Bob, you're going to get called out, build a Bob, uh, you know, won't like this. That's great, because they're not, they're not using their own opinion. They are taking the research data, putting the facts from it and saying, this fact that I remember from this persona isn't relevant, or, you know, proves that this is not relevant. It's obviously not the end of the conversation, because someone else may say, um, but, you know, um, competitive Christina is going to love it. Uh, and so, it, but they are not having an argument with their own opinion. What they are doing there is having an argument with the research data to then have a, this conversation, which is definitely what you want to go for. So personas summarize real research de data so they're easy to remember and crucially, it's more likely to be used. I, I cannot emphasize enough how good personas are. I'm a huge fan, a bit too much. So I know what you're thinking, this sounds like it's hard. It's hard to convince your team to uh, spend the time understanding what the research you're going to run is before you actually run it. It's hard to convince your team to take part in facilitating note-taking or workshopping activities. It's hard to convince them to spend money on doing research before they make something. They, they have divine inspiration and they know how these things are going to work, so why do they need to do research beforehand? And there's only one solution to that, which is a long and hard solution, and that is being an embedded researcher with your team. So taking the time to attend all of their meetings, understanding what they're working on currently, what upcoming uh, decisions they have to make, and where there's a potential for research. Until you get your team to understand what research is and how it can be applied, they're not going to come to you to say, oh, we should be doing some research before this decision, and so you have to be with them. Um, this does mean spending a lot of time and it's very hard. It's also going to be a long process, particularly if you work at an agency or in a team that supports multiple games, uh, because you don't have a lot of time to spend with each of your teams. But through demonstrating the value of research, exploring some of these techniques in some level of depth and gradually building up to doing more and more research earlier and earlier, you can help uh, raise the level of understanding of how user research can be applied with your teams and then help us just do a better job at it. Cool. cool. Thanks very much. Um, so, 
I'm very aware that we spent the last few minutes um, beating on uh, game visa research compared to mainstream. So I just want to remind you guys why you're in this room and why you work in game visa research. Sorry, Steve. Uh, so, um, game visa research has more interesting research questions. In mainstream visa research, 99% of the time is transaction. Can I buy this thing? Or it's task completion. So can I fill in this form? Can I find this piece of information? It's very binary. It's yes or no. Can I do this? Yes, great, tick, move on. Or can I do this? No, okay, where, where's it gone wrong? Make it tick, move on. It's, it, it's nowhere near as interesting as what we're working with here. There's no, there's no game where you just go, can they do this thing? It's, you know, how are they finding it? What's their experience? It's much, much, much more sort of fine grain, much more detail, and much more uncertainty around the research questions we're dealing with. And that's great, I love that. Uh, there is a lot more unexplored frontiers. So, I was saying, I was complaining just a couple of minutes ago that games user research is a lot less developed than mainstream user research. For me, that is a good thing. We are constantly finding new methods, new approaches, new things that we can do and, and insights that we can discover because there is this undevelopment, uh, undeveloped state of the whole industry. Uh, if you go to mainstream, everything is pretty much codified already. You want to do this research question, here's the method. You want to do this research question, here's the method. There's not very much new, or not anywhere near to the same degree as here. Also, tougher challenges. As I was referring earlier, uh, it's binary, yes or no. And when you can get that fix, it's job done. Whereas in games user research, we're talking about feelings, we're talking about emotions. Like uh, a mainstream user research, you give them a game, uh, and say, do the best you can do with it, they all create a button that says, win. And you click it, and everyone's happy, and everyone's done it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about emotions and feelings, games that can make people sad or happy. We also have passionate people. And is, there's, I can't emphasize this enough. We are so, we're in such a lucky industry. Anyone in this room, or anyone you work with, can earn 20% more just by walking out the door and going to work somewhere else but they choose not to because they want to work here. They want to work here because they're passionate. They love games, and they love the thing they do. And that means you need to use that passion, harness that passion, to work together to make a better game. But it, this industry is also really unusual because not only are the people making the things passionate, the people receiving the things are also passionate. Like, I, I just love that, it's amazing. Um, these, I mean, people are choosing to play games in their spare time. I hate to get a bit morbid, but you've only got a certain number of hours that you have in existence before you're dead. And yet, they choose to spend it with this, these products that we work on, these things that we do. They make them happy, and they want to do it. That's an incredible privilege, and it's something we should really, really celebrate and appreciate. Uh, and we also get the best new tech. Uh, so motion control, VR, AR, all this stuff comes to us first second after military, but let's move on quickly. Um, so w we get these challenges. How on earth do you navigate a menu using motion control? How do you move using VR? All this stuff, all these challenges were tackled in games user research first. We solved them. Everyone else is now going to be copying them because we got to use it first. We got to find the problems and find the challenges and solve them. And that's great. It means we get to go first. Uh, so everyone here is here to make games better. But I want to, hopefully, with the things that we've been talking about today, we can make games even better. Um, final thoughts? Steve, do you want to go first, yeah, actually? Uh, I think there's... Uh, I hope we've highlighted there's a huge potential for research to have an even greater impact, uh, both helping teams understand where research can be applied and helping them make better decisions about how, how to implement stuff, how it works, uh, and help remove this idea that games work by divine inspiration. Instead, let's make people understand, OK, well, I can learn something and have even better inspiration about the stuff I'm going to make. Um, Alistair? Cool. Yeah. Um, what he said. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I, I think also it, it, it worries me and it saddens me that so often in the games industry, people are betting the house and betting people's jobs on guesswork and hunches when there are methods available that can remove or at least add some semblance of, uh, not exactly an insurance, but re reducing the risk that you're taking every time you produce a product. Why not 
just check and see whether this, this amazing idea you have is actually going to resonate. Uh, I'm sure uh, EA are regretting the fact that they haven't done enough research in monetization recently. Uh, <laughs> they, could have, they could have reduced this impact significantly by just doing some more preliminary research around that before it got a bit over, over the top. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Stick your hand up and I'm going to come to you. Please wait for the microphone. Questions? Hands up. Let's go. Come on out. Ah, hi. Okay. The questions are... Hi. Um, thanks very much for your talk. It's a really interesting subject for me because I've spent some time in both areas mm. and really puzzled by the, dis you know, the differences in practice. Um, Mainstream is new to me. I'm finally joining the mainstream at my age, right? <laughs> and I look around and I see all this stuff around, um, you know, service design and design thinking. And um, in thinking of how that applies to games, there's this area that I think is just really marshy and difficult to go to. And I don't know if you've about latent needs because you talk about you know, the kind of design explorations people would do, like at IDEO, and they go off into the, into the shrubbery somewhere and, you know, um, try and analyze what people's real problems are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be interested to see if that's actually possible to apply to games. I, I think it's really hard, but have you seen any good examples of it, or do you think it's impossible, or what do you think? Do you want me to go with you? <laughs> um, you go first. Or should you just not yes. go there? <laughs> Alistair will tell me where I got it wrong. Uh, so, user needs are difficult for games because their needs are very high level. They're to be entertained or to have a good experience or not, to, not for bad things to happen. So it's much easier, I assume, as a designer to define your hypotheses about what you think it should be. So a lean methodology where you're saying, okay, I think this is going to happen and this is... Uh, the result I expect to see, and then tackling that. I think it's a really interesting area to explore, though. I, I haven't seen anything about it, though. It seems really tricky. Yes, you yeah. Come up, you come up with anything. You go fishing in there, and you come up with anything. Come and tell us about it. Sounds good, yeah. Did you have any? Um, not really. I think, so quite often games could potentially miss a trick by not just looking around that, sort of that area, but also finding out about people's habits and, and forming, rather than sort of going, what are their needs? Because their need is, as Steve says, to be entertained, but you could kind of go, okay, so where can that need be fulfilled? And sort of looking, okay, so they're, they're playing games on the tube. Why are they playing games on the tube? Because it's the only time they have available. Okay, so what are the restrictions around the environment that they're playing there? And so they're developing from a slightly different perspective of we're just gonna make a game to we're making a game and here's the restrictions. And this is why we're applying those restrictions. So sort of fitting the game around the person's life more. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hello. Um, at the start of the talk, you sort of raised the differences between the industries and mainstream and GUR, uh, one of them being secrecy and not being able to communicate research between different uh, companies. That sounds like a bad thing. Um, would you say it is? And do you think it's going to change or should it change over time as the industry develops? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, go for yeah. it. Oh, yes, I, I think it's a bad thing. Uh, that, that's kind of why I stood up here and sort of highlighted it as a major problem. Um, I would really want it to change. Uh, I'm sure it will over time. Um, the problem is, as I say, it, it's a kind of, it's a special industry in that it's, the, a lot of the games that we produce, it's all about experience. And so it's a one-shot thing. Uh, I've about to sort of spoil a few things there, but maybe I shouldn't do that. But, um, you know, once you know what's going on in the sixth sense, there's no point seeing it again. And so I'm sure that film industry or that, that um, the, the, film, uh, the production company was super, super secretive because they had to be. Um, however, uh, it doesn't mean we, we, A, always have to be like that, and B, it doesn't mean we can't find ways to communicate something. Uh, and so, yeah, I think... The sooner we are able to communicate something, the, the faster we can develop and get better at what we do. It's as simple as that, really. I, th I think there's plenty of potential as well. So one of the methods we talked about today was competitor reviews. 
um, that isn't your game, and it's a release game, and it's uh, not secret, and the whole community can benefit from understanding your insight on usability issues with this game or usability issues with these features. Um, so perhaps encouraging this idea of researchers sharing across the industry best practice will help us all be better at our jobs and all have more impact with our development teams. So I think there might be potential. I think, yeah. So Steve, Steve works in government and um, they have a, a very emphatic, almost they're almost ordered to share as much as possible. Um, all data, everything. Just well, I mean, it's a very different area because obviously they, they want people to kind of build on, on the stand on the shoulders of giants. But it doesn't mean we can't do the same. It's just harder. Hello. Oh, okay. Hi guys. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, I've got a question about the collaborative analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you do that? Because I mean. I've done it a bit as well, yep. and I know that it's really good, important, and that, and all you said basically. Um, however, there's one issue that uh, I mean, there's a risk that the team actually goes back, you know, home and the next day to their office and uh, actually start working on solutions and don't wait for the report. So, how do you ensure that they actually wait for the report and and read it and digest it and then act on it? Um, a method you could do is, with your team, define the bit where you think about solutions after the report. So as long as you set expectations with your team where we do this analysis, then there's a report, and then I'm going to help facilitate a session with you where we work out what to do about these issues with SIN, and you get some of my usability insights. Um, you will hopefully encourage the teams to wait until that time when you've said, this is the time when we think about solutions, before actually implementing things, although they'll be thinking of it from the analysis, but at least you get to sanity check it at that point to say, um, that was a great idea, but actually, based on my insight, here's why you shouldn't do that. That might be one way. The other way is, don't do collaborative analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think as long as you're super, super careful with the messaging mm. and make them know that this is stage one, and then we're going to sort of step in and do stage two, and then stage three is the delivery of the report. It's a, I, I think it's a good thing if someone walks away having seen some really nice sort of uh, issues and want to immediately start fixing it. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as they don't go too far down that train, and then you can't turn it too late. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, um, so communication, making sure that they know, that, you know, when they walk away, they're going to make this change and this change and you've heard what changes they're going to do first, and you're okay with those, and then let's discuss the rest later kind of thing. And hopefully just mitigate that damage. This idea of consistency and having an established process is something that you can build up with, with your relationship with the team, so they always know to expect it, and it's really good. Um, hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, like you have worked in both um, main user research and game user research, and there was a method that I really liked to use when I was working in mainstream user research, which is called uh, diary studies, and I've never had the chance to apply it to game user research, and I thought it'd be so beneficial for, for some games that players play over a long period of time, and I was wondering if, if you had the chance to, to use that on the games that you worked on. Um, am I allowed to? Rob, am I allowed to talk about it? <laughs> um, I know that uh, it has been applied to, for game user research. There are a number of reasons why it's difficult. This idea of secrecy that you have to keep the, the, the game secret and won't get shared with people in a right audience before the marketing push for it, um, which make it challenging. So there's a number of way, places where it could be applied better or could c overcome that challenge. Iterative games, things like free-to-play or mobile games, where the game is out and it's going to continue to be worked on and get better, it does seem like a really beneficial place for uh, for diary studies to be applied. Uh, also, if you're working on sequels or follow-ups to existing things, you can learn a lot by looking at people's behaviour with the previous one uh, via diary study. So it does seem like an area where uh, I know that PlayStation have explored before and have done some good work on, um, and there is plenty of potential to apply it as well. I don't know if you've 
had experience with it. Yeah, yeah, we've done loads. <laughs> um, it's great. It's super useful. I'm sitting in front of, I'm standing in front of a client who paid us to do one, and hopefully they found it super useful as well. Uh, I, I won't, I can't say who it is, but hopefully they'll come find you and tell you. Um, it, all, all these issues apply. Um, I, I, I find it really, really useful for obviously the long-term experience games. So mobile games, it's it's great. It's really good for like a sort of a short-term experience console game. Less useful because you can just get them to play it, you know, uh, in the studio. <coughs> there's less risk of leaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the the biggest issue we find is essentially um, persuading clients that it's it's worth the time and the money because uh, it is it takes a lot of time and you end up with just I think I could swear you end up with just a shit ton of data like more than you can possibly cope with and you end up kind of beautiful mind style a whole room filled with post its and you're moving things around and everyone thinks you're going a little bit mental because it just there's so much data going in. And you have to kind of trans sort of process it and transfer it and build it down and down and down to, to a decent sized report. Um, and it takes time. Uh, but yeah, they're great, basically, is the answer. Yes. That's probably time. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. That's everyone. our last one. Thank you very much, Alistair and Steve. <laughs>